Last week I gave you meat. You think you can handle chewing again this morning? <laughs> Who can handle chewing on some meat of the word of God today? Amen? Yeah. It's not going to be fluffy again. I don't know. I got to tell you, I don't know why. Sometimes God takes me through these seasons where messages are just a little bit more... Mm. <laughs> so, Bring it, Pastor. We're still here. <laughs> yes. Amen? Yes. Look, we're still here. Jesus didn't come back yesterday. And I can't tell you how disappointed I actually am. I really, really, really would have been totally okay with being robbed yesterday. I have no problem with that whatsoever. But we're still here. And there are going to be people in the world that are going to be mocking the church because there were date setters in the church. Now, I want to let you know, if you follow my Facebook this week, I kind of alluded to some of the stuff this week. I have never, ever, ever agreed with the date setter at any time in church history because God, the word says, no man knows the day or hour. Right. That doesn't mean that we're not supposed to be aware of the season. I preached about that two weeks ago, but we're going to talk a little more about that this morning. That doesn't mean we're not supposed to be aware of the season. But as soon as someone puts a date on it, I am pretty confident that God in heaven takes out his planner and says, let's move it. Because <laughs> these people think they can set a date. Does that negate signs that we might see in the heavenlies? Does that negate the, the, the fullness of, of what we looked at about blood moons or about the revelation uh, was 12 1 sign? Or does that negate um, the eclipses and all these different signs that we have? Does it negate the fact that we've had more earthquakes this summer and coming into this fall? Do you realize, I mean, it's shaking in North Korea, not just the bombs, but it's shaking in North Korea, it's shaking in Japan, it's shaking off of California. They are expecting the potential for a volcano to blow in Yellowstone Park because they've had, they've had double the tremors. They've had over a year's worth of tremors just this summer by one of the main volcanoes there. We, we've got, it's just in Mexico, and not one, but two earthquakes. I mean, the floods are raging. We're seeing whole islands wiped out by the waters. You can't you can't just like say that that doesn't mean anything. But the thing is, after someone goes out and sticks a date on it, and then, I mean, even Fox News and ABC and CBS, they picked up stories about the end of the world. First of all, they need to realize something. The rapture of the church is not the end of the world. It's the beginning of trouble. But it's not the end of the world. That's going to come. But it's not the end of the world. It's the beginning of trouble. They just don't get that part. But it is a serious hope and belief of the body of Christ, of the church. And when we see all these signs around us, we need to take note of these things. And just because we're still here today, did y'all look at my Facebook post this week? In case I'm gone, someone come and take care of my dogs and the puppies? <laughs> I actually had one of the people who bought one of my puppies say, thanks for leaving my name. <laughs> I'm thinking, going, I'm thinking going, okay, so you're not planning my event. <laughs> and I'm going, I'm thinking, are you really thankful for that? I just have to think twice about that. But it's like, you know, we just don't know that they're over. And you know the other thing that's funny with these is that it's not the 23rd of September everywhere at the same time. Yeah. You're aware of that? Yeah. I and mean, if you've ever traveled internationally, you're in a different day. I remember being in the Philippines, and we were on a different day of the week than everybody else when we traveled to the Philippines. I mean, even there's part of the days. So whose time frame does Jesus come back on? His. His. It doesn't matter what our mountain zone is or Pacific zone or whatever it might be. The problem that happens is when we see such a buildup to such things, and we've seen it throughout history. We've seen a lot of it even in our own lifetimes. We, I mean, when we t- turned into the new millennium, there was a lot of fear going on, a lot of the Y2K bug, a lot of fear about the return of Christ. There were a lot of books being written about the second coming of Jesus that are now a dime a dozen on the Goodwill Bookshelf. But the problem that happens with all of that is that we go through this intensity, and then when it doesn't happen, everybody sets back and begins to laugh, doubt, let faith wane. Or they just think that it's never going to happen. But that's not what's going on. Every time something like this stirs our minds to be thinking, it's actually a good thing. Because in reality, though, though hearts that don't have faith 
Even a lot of Christian hearts that are so critical and cynical, hearts that are looking for the return of Christ, it's a marker. It's something for us to mark by that we're that much closer to Jesus coming back. Amen. We're that much closer to his return. And though people will grow cynical and though faith is going to die in the hearts of some, it should do something different in the heart of the true Christian, the true follower of Christ. So there are three things I want to talk about that these things should be doing in our lives. Are you ready for them? Amen. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. I told you it's going to be meat this morning. And you might say, we just talked about, you know, waiting, wanting, and watching two weeks ago. Yep, we're going to go a little further this morning. Because the first thing that all of this stuff should be doing to us is awakening our spirit. It should awaken our spirit, man. There should be a fresh awareness arising from slumber spiritually, a new fervor that takes place in our hearts as Christians. Our time is short. Because the reality is, though someone set a date on what was going to happen, like I said, it doesn't take away the fact that the signs aren't intensifying. That should make our spirit man wake up and awaken to the fact that it's coming close. Let me tell you, The church of Jesus Christ is so asleep, especially in America. We are so step off of dead. We're comatose as a church. We're not reaching the lost. Churches are declining. Churches are closing. We're taking all kinds of heresies into the body of Christ, trying to say that the church is saying that all kinds of sin are now okay. We're not reaching out to our neighbors. We're not discipling each other. We're not strengthening one another as the body of Christ. We need to wake up. We need to wake up. Because Jesus is coming back. One of the things that Jesus said was, when I come back, will I find faith on the earth? I sometimes wonder. Sometimes I get frustrated as a pastor. I'm going to be honest with you. I get frustrated sometimes when I see the, the state of the church. I think we have an awesome church. I think you're all awesome people. But sometimes I think that we should be drawing closer to Jesus more than we are. And God has to remind me, if you feel that way, how do you think I feel sometimes? That's true, God. That's true. (laughs) You know, interestingly enough, as we're going through the day yesterday, I kept on wondering, so is there a specific time that he's supposed to come today? (laughs) And while we're sitting there, my wife gets this, you know, the iPhone. We just did the new update. She had this new, an, a news article flash onto her screen. Is the microchip the new way people will buy and sell? Wow. That stuff doesn't start waking us up what will. Because I remember, and I know I'm getting old, but I remember when I was a kid thinking, how on earth are people going to want to take the mark of the beast? Aren't they just going to know it's the mark of the beast? And I remember when I was a kid, and it talked about, you know, that you're going to need a bag of gold to buy a loaf of bread. Well, you know, you can't watch TV anymore without people saying, invest in gold. I mean, in the last decade, it's all been about investing in gold. You know, what do the investors know that you don't know? I'm like, well, I know Jesus is coming back, and I know I don't have to invest in your gold because I'm not going to be around when you're going to need it. But other people... They're trying to even financially prepare themselves. And I used to never think, how would people take that mark? But you know what? They're already forcing employees to take it at companies now. My dogs are microchipped. I'm not getting microchipped. Ephesians 5.14 says this. For the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, awake, O sleeper. Rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you life. Light. Romans 13, 11 to 14 says this. Now listen, I'm going to read through this slowly because I want you to hear not what I'm saying, but I want you to hear what God's word says. This is all the more urgent. For you know how late 
it is. Time is running out. Wake up. For our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. If he could write that 2,000 years ago, are we not closer? The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shiny armor of right living. Because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and don't let yourself think about ways to indulge in evil desires. That should be a slap across the face of most Christians in the church today. Go back in. You know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up! For our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost gone, and the day of salvation will soon be here. Remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shiny armor of right living. It's time, church, that we stop sleeping. It's time that we stop allowing apathy, spiritual apathy and slumber to overtake us. We are in spiritual comas and we start realizing that it's not just about putting our behinds in the pew or the chair on Sunday morning. It's not just about singing a few worship songs in church, but it's really about getting our lives to be living in a right order with God. It's time that we start putting off this world and waking up and being ready for when Jesus comes back. Two weeks ago I alluded to this parable, Matthew 25, 1-13. This morning I want to read it because it's so real for right now. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish. Five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps. But the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed. Okay, we're still here. When the bridegroom was delayed. We've been waiting for thousands of years, Pastor Rob. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by the shout. Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. What's taken place over the last weeks has been an awareness of people saying, Look, the bridegroom is coming. Are you ready to meet him? Wake up! All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. See, it was actually talking, everybody had kind of fallen off to sleep. But when they awoke from their slumber, some of them were still ready and prepared and some of them did not have the oil. And I believe that oil represents the Spirit of God moving in their lives. But the others replied, we don't have enough oil for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy the oil, the bridegroom came. Sometimes we think, oh, you know, I'm just, you know, uh, I'm just going to hang here. And Jesus comes, I'll be ready. I know I'm going. But are we really ready? Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast. And the door was locked. This was a warning to the church. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or hour of my return. We need to awake, church. We need to not be asleep. By the way, I wrote this message on Friday. I didn't wait till after yesterday and then wait right this morning. We need to be awake. We need to be ready. You know, 
How many have teenagers at home right now? Or have, have you had teenagers? Ever have, have you had teenagers? You ever try to get them up in the morning for school? Just 15 more minutes. You're going to be late. I'll make it on time. No, you won't. Yes, I will. Get up. She's not in your brain. I experience this on a regular basis. You can get Mark Tardy to school, but you can't be late for the rapture. You hear what I'm saying? You can get Mark late for school, but you can't get Mark late for the rapture. When it happens, it happens, it's done. We need to wake up and be alert. We need to wake up and allow our spiritual fervor to wake up with us. And when we do that, it will lead us to the next thing I want to talk about, which is that we need to create a greater faithfulness. Can you say that with me? Create a greater faithfulness. Let that just sink in a <clears throat> Just like so many different modern tragedies, 9-11, Y2K, we saw surges in church attendance. All of a sudden, everybody was getting faithful to God because they thought maybe it was coming to that point in life. Maybe Jesus was coming back. How quickly did those surges wane? How quickly did they begin to fall apart? Because it's not just about what we say, I'm faithful. Say what we believe. Do you realize that true faith is seen by our actions? Faith is a verb. It's not a noun. It's not something you possess. It's something you do. And when faith is real, faith will be played out in our lives. It will be played out in how we serve the Lord. It will be played out in how we live. It will be played out in what we do in the church of Jesus Christ. It will be played out in how we reach out to the lost. It will be played out in how we act and behave. Not just in what we speak and say. I said it already once. Jesus has said, when I come back, will I find faith on the earth? How do you see faith? What does he mean? He wants to see. He's coming back for a church that's faithful. Faithful. Because the word of God calls us to a greater faithfulness. Hebrews 10 verses 23 to 25 says this. We hear it. I've read it. I've quoted it. But I'm going to say it again. And I'm going to point out a couple of things. And I don't want you to get mad at me. Okay? It says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. Well, Jesus promised what? He promised he's coming back, didn't he? Amen. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Didn't we talk about serving last week? And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do. But encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Okay, the author of Hebrews is saying that the more we see the promise of his coming, of his return, the more we see that day approaching, the more we should be serving in the body of Christ, the more we should be coming together as the body of Christ, the more we should be encouraging and discipling one another in the body of Christ. We should be building one another up. We should be encouraging. We should be getting together. We should be serving. I read another article this week. Now, I don't want this to chase everybody out of the church, but I'm just going to say this right now. The average church attender in this time in history gets to church once a month. I remember as a kid going to church three times, four times a week. Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday school, Sunday morning service, Sunday night service, youth group, prayer meeting. 
we were always getting together. Now, if we get to church once a week, we're like the faithful people. Because the average church attender gets to church once a month. Now, let me just ask you this question. Does that sound like a church that's awakened? Does that sound like a church that's expecting the return of Jesus Christ at any time? Does that sound like a church that's even following God's word when he says, and forsake not the assembling of yourselves together all the more as you see that day approaching? Why is it that everything else is more important than getting to church? Well, it's just church pastors getting in the building and singing some songs. Okay, I didn't invent church. I didn't. Jesus did. In fact, the Bible tells us there are 110 references in the New Testament to the church. Ecclesia. So when people try and say that church is a man-made idea, baloney, you haven't read your word recently. It is God who ordained the church. It is Jesus who is the head of the body of Christ. And he has put it there for a purpose. He's put it there for so we can be an encouragement to one another. So we can serve. So we can serve our community. So we can proclaim the gospel. So we can help each other. So we can disciple one another. It serves a purpose. But you see what's happened is we're teaching. We're discipling ourselves in the wrong way in the church. And over the past decade, 15 years, it's just gone further and further away from what God's intent was. If you look at the early church, they got together every day and broke bread with one another. Every day. I've had people come up to me through the years and go, Pastor, why don't we just get together every day and have church? And I just look at them, you start showing up on Sunday morning, I'll start doing that. (laughs) Everyone's got a great idea. Pastor, you do it. I'm not doing this for my own health either, folks. You know what I'm saying? We're supposed to be coming together greater faithfulness. You know, there's a story. I love this story. When I heard this story, I've used it a lot. But it's, there was a study done on these gorillas. And they had this cage in the zoo, or the science lab, whatever it was. And they put in five gorillas. And they put a set of steps. And at the top of the steps hanging was a massive bunch of bananas. And what does a gorilla normally do by his own nature? Goes for the bananas. I mean, that's what they eat. It's food. Basic need. And when the gorillas started making their way up the steps, they took out a massive firehouse, <laughs> knocked them all down. Every time they tried to go up the steps, <laughs> knocked them all down. To the point where the gorillas sat on the ground and never went for the bananas anymore. Okay, they trained them. That's great. Let's take one gorilla out and put a new gorilla in. What's the new gorilla going to do? Go for the bananas. But wait. Instead of turning down the hose, the other four gorillas grab the gorilla and pull him down so he doesn't get blasted by the hose. Let a little bit of time go by. And now you have five gorillas who never have been hit by the hose or seen the hose before. And the bananas just sit there and rot. Why? Because one by one, they train the gorillas to all the gorillas were trained. This is how we do it. This is how we do it. So I ask us, have we trained ourselves as the body of Christ? Say, I don't need to go to church. I don't need to come out to Bible study. I don't need to go to life group. I don't need to to go to Sunday morning. I don't need to do uh, an extra service. I don't need any of that because I can just be okay on my own. And that's what everybody else does. And what happens then when the new gorillas come into our church? Not to call me monkeys. (laughs) But when the new folks come in, What do they learn from us? What are we teaching them? Are we teaching them to be faithful? Just let that hang in the air for a minute. Is the 
kingdom of God a priority in our lives. Revelation 3, 7 to 13. Jesus speaks this to the faithful church at Philadelphia. He said, write this letter to the angel of the church of Philadelphia. This is the message from the one who is holy and true. The one who has the key of David. What he opens, no one can close. And what he closes, no one can open. I know all the things you do, and I have opened a door for you that no one can close. It's the door to salvation. It's the door to the rapture. You have little strength, yet you obeyed my word and did not deny me. Look, I will force those who belong to Satan's synagogue, those liars who say they are Jews but are not, to come and bow down at your feet. They will acknowledge that you are the ones I love. It's talking to the faithful church here. Because you obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. This is why we believe that the faithful church will not go through the tribulation when Jesus comes back, but will be raptured out. Let me say that again. Because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God and they will never have to leave it. And I will write on them the name of my God. And they will be citizens in the city of my God. The new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. There's a lot of preaching these days that are scratching people's ears to tell us what we want to hear. But this morning I want to tell you what you need to hear, what I need to hear, what I need to remind myself of and that we all need to remind ourselves. That God is coming back for a church that is faithful. He's coming back to a church that is looking at this word and not just saying, I don't have to obey that part of it. Why is it? I was driving by the Bronco Stadium last night. We, we went down to Colorado Springs yesterday. And we're driving back up, and the lights were all on in the stadium, and you could see the big horse up there coming from the south and stuff. And we were wondering if there was a game or something last night, or maybe they're just getting ready for today. And it was, we're coming up, and, and then my wife said, Man, do people really sit out there when it's like weather like this and go to a game? And I'm like, Oh, yeah. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Thousands upon thousands of people will pack up stadiums across this country in pouring rain, in high winds, in freezing temperatures, in snow, so they can watch. Uh, and they'll pay $300, $500 a seat to do it, to watch a couple of guys throw a piece of pitch in down the field that has no earthly value in the distance of anything. And yet we can't get ourselves to church for 90 minutes on a Sunday morning. Wow. Sorry, I just had to say that. Wow. It just tells you where our priorities are as the body of Christ. It tells you where our focus is. As we see this day approaching, we need to create a greater faithfulness. It's in that faithfulness that the lost are going to go, what on earth is going on with those people? What do they know that I don't know? And through that, did I like blow up the mic or something? No, I just blew up the battery. And through that, you want it? Through that, they'll see something different. But we got to stop. We got to stop being the gorillas, showing people how not to do it. And we got to start being the body of Christ, showing people what faithfulness is faithfulness in attending, faithfulness in serving, faithfulness in proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the time is short. 
You know what went through my mind the most this week? I asked my daughter at least five times, are you ready if Jesus does come back on Saturday? And if I knew it wouldn't provoke, and I know my son's ready. I mean, he's been on staff for the church. I hope he's ready. But you know, being on the staff at the church doesn't make you ready. There will be preachers who will be left behind. I just want to call up. And I knew he'd just get at me for date setting. I'm like, I'm not, you know. But I just want, are you ready? But it should, that same image. Who do you know? Who do you love? What child of yours? What sibling of yours? Where's the cord? It still doesn't work. You can hear me, can't you? I got a big mouth. (laughs) <laughs> well placed well placed timing there. <laughs> I do have a big mouth I know that I don't think the battery's good but that's okay here now can I take it off then who do you know who in your life if you really did believe that Jesus Christ was coming back in the next day Who are you concerned about not making it to heaven? And if you have someone that you're concerned about not making it, what are you doing about that? What are you doing to change that? Because I really don't think we believe it's going to happen. Because we don't do anything. Let this marker in time remind us that we need to be faithful and create a greater faithfulness. Last thing. Last thing, we need to set ourselves apart for God. Actually, let me correct that. We need to set ourselves apart to God. To God. And to Him alone. Nobody talks about being set apart anymore. Nobody talks about holiness anymore. In fact, what I see in the body of Christ is a group of people because we've begun training each other in the church. Oh yeah, we used to have all these rules. We used to be legalistic. We used to have all these bondages. And we used to tell people, well, you can't do this and you can't do that. We can do all of that stuff now. We're so to heaven. God's grace is enough. And we've stopped setting ourselves apart to God. And you know what we have for that? A really dirty church. It's like if you watched a bride, and think of how people... Set up for weddings these days. The thousands upon thousands of dollars spent on weddings. Finding the perfect dress. Finding the perfect venue. Nothing wrong with that. I have no problem with celebrating weddings. But can you imagine if the bride walks down the aisle and she looks like she's been rolling in the dirt. (laughs) And her hair sticking out like this and she's got mud all over her clothes. Her husband might just go, you didn't care enough about me to clean up today? (laughs) Seriously? Well, that's because you've been getting free for the past 20 years, and that's, you know, she didn't care. Sorry, but you know, do you all know what God's Word says about these things? Because in the modern church of Jesus Christ, we've got to start making some things right with God. This is what Jesus says. This is what the Word says about what Christ is coming back for. In Ephesians 5, 25 to 27, it says, For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. I'm going to be hoarse if I don't do something. Am I on? There I go. How novel I'm holding the mic. (laughs) For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean. That's what Jesus did for us. He died to make us holy and clean. And washed by the cleansing of God's word. Now I want you to take a a moment and notice that term. Washed by the cleansing of God's word. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Why? Verse 27 tells us. He did this to present her to himself. As a glorious church. Without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead she will be holy and without fault. Jesus died on the cross to make us righteous before him. He gave up his own life 
so we can live for him. When he comes back for us, he doesn't want us just to have our little card that says, I asked Jesus into my heart and I'm forgiven. He wants us to have adorned ourselves in the white robes of righteousness. Now, when you first get saved, nobody expects you to be a perfect Christian. And we all know that we won't reach perfection on this earth. But sanctification, becoming like Jesus, is a process that we are supposed to be engaged in from now until he returns or from now until we die. Because he's coming back for a church that's adorned without a spot or a wrinkle that's ready for him. A people who have set themselves apart for holiness. That's what holy means. Set apart. For him and him alone. And if you guys want to see your bride walking down an aisle with your wife's five or six lovers dragging behind her, all dirtied up from romping in the hay, And yet, how often are we committing adultery, spiritual adultery, with this world on a regular basis, and we're expecting to walk down the aisle when Jesus comes and say, this is the way you get me? Smacks me right between the eyes. When are we going to realize we need to set ourselves apart? Now, hopefully you all show up to church again next week. And you won't think, man, that pastor, he's just like me. He's cruel. He's so hard. I can't have any fun anymore. He's so difficult. You know what? I love you just the way you are. Jesus does too. But you know what? He doesn't want to see you like a dirty bride on his wedding day. He doesn't want to see us that way. He wants us to be set apart. He wants us to be pure and holy. He's coming for us. Do we realize we love this world too much? We love it too much. We're so enthralled with this world. We give all of our time, all of our attention, all of our energy to embrace this world. But we're not citizens of this world. We're citizens of heaven. This is not our home, the Bible tells us. There's another home that we're waiting for. If you don't want to grow to be like Jesus... And you don't like come if you don't like coming to church and worshiping Jesus, if you don't like being with Jesus' people, you're not going to like heaven. What do you think you're going to do for eternity? We're going to be in his presence. We're going to be adored. Let's get ready. First Peter 2, verses 9 to 12. I'm almost done. But you are not like that. For you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy or set-apart nation. He's talking to the spiritual Israel, us, those who've come to find Christ. God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. Oh, so because we're allowing him to change us now, we can show others the goodness of God. You know, I, I stepped away from something. I want to go back to it. Do you remember in the last verse that I read, it talked about cleansed by the washing of the word. That's because when we get into this thing, it tells us how to live. We are saved by faith and grace and made righteousness in Christ. But then he wants us to be daily cleansed in the word and transformed into his image. Now let's go on. For he who called you out of the darkness into his wonderful life, once you had no identity as a people, but now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy... Now you have received God's mercy. Dear friends, I warn you. This is what what he writes. I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners. That's what we are on this earth. Temporary residents and foreigners. To keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. They might not give honor to God over your life right now, 
But one day they're going to have to recognize, if you're living that life rightly before God, that they're going to have to recognize what God has done in you when he judges the world. Hebrews 11, 16 says, But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And last, I want to read from 1 Peter 1, 13 to 16. It says, So prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. Stop picking and choosing. We gotta stop picking God for his blessings and picking God for what he does for us and asking God for peace and asking God for mercy and asking God for grace. And we gotta start saying, Lord, I need to grow to be like you. I need to let go of the things in this world. I need to let my life, if, if I've received you into my heart as my Savior, I need to stop holding on to the world and start holding on to Jesus. I gotta start letting go of what's out here and start holding on to what's to come. Because that's what's forever. You can have your job, you can have your house, you can even have your family, you can have all of that. And it's going to be good for what? 30, 40, 50 years? 60 years maybe? 70, 80? Talk in the double span. But when you're holding on to Jesus, that's eternity. That's eternity. And I hate to say this to you all right now, but I'm going to say it anyhow. Every one of you who sat in this room right now, you have no excuse. And I'm risking, I'm risking you not liking me and telling you because as your pastor, I never want to have to stand before God and say, I was too busy trying to make sure you were happy and you always wanted to come to church because it gave you light, flowery feelings and that I didn't tell you what God's word said about living right for him. Amen. We cannot let the intensity, we cannot let the intensity of the events and the things that are happening in our world and the lack of Jesus' return on a set date dissuade us from believing that God's word is true and that he is so coming and that we are drawing closer to that return. We cannot allow the fact that he didn't come back yesterday say, well, he might not come back now for another decade. Well, if he doesn't come back for a decade, think of everything we could do in that decade. We could retrain the gorillas that the bananas are good. Deal with the spray and eat of the good stuff. We could retrain them what it is to be faithful to the house of God. We could retrain. We can allow our spirits to rise up and become aware and stop sleeping through this life and being spiritually comatose and allow a greater awareness of his presence and make him more known in this world. As we serve Him in faithfulness, we can see our loved ones, our family members, our kids, our parents, our siblings, our neighbors, come to Jesus Christ. We can use this time to get our hearts and our lives prepared to go to heaven. To have the oil trimmed in our lamps, ready to burn brightly for Him. And showing the world This is the difference that Jesus makes in your life. Let's stop trying to come up with all the excuses to be just like the world. Isn't it great? We can be just like the world. We dance and we drink and we gamble and we smoke and we do drugs and we do all this stuff and we go to church on Sunday and Jesus loves us. We're all going to heaven because nothing matters. Or does it? 